Right, so uh, I think we can uh, slowly start. So uh, I really didn't expect uh, so many of you so early in the morning. So uh, hope you grabbed your uh, morning coffee and uh, we can start. So uh, the session today will be about Go language. I'll try to present our experience uh, using Go and compare it and contrast it a little bit with uh, C. And uh, before I start, how many of you have been using Go before? Okay, how many in production? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, not a lot. So uh, I hope after this talk uh, we'll have a bit better overview of what Go is and uh, what uh, its limitations are and uh, what are the advantages as well. So. Uh, Uh, let me start with my personal view on Go. It's very subjective opinion, but uh, also supported by my colleagues who are also using Go. I really think it's a very productive programming language, especially when it comes to some kind of network programming. And uh, I'm not necessarily mean it's uh, any kind of like heavy server programming but uh, rather any kind of application where you are using network for uh, communicating. And uh, I am by any means not uh, claiming that uh, Go is a replacement for C, because there are many places you cannot replace C. And uh, it's not Go, it's uh, any language in general, like uh, when you are doing some kind of like are no hard real-time systems, operating systems, device drivers, all those places are uh, irreplaceable by uh, any other language, I think. And uh, during this talk, uh, I will start with uh, telling you a bit about Go itself and uh, our experience with uh, selecting Go as a programming language. Uh, then we'll look at uh, basics and uh, some code samples. And finally, I'll present you some uh, demo application. I'm having uh, BeagleBone with a simple Go application running, a couple of sensors here, so I will try to show that. And uh, a little bit about me. So uh, my name is Marcin Pasinski. I've been doing software development for more than 10 years. It was mostly C and C++, but uh, recently I'm doing also Go development. There are my contact details there if you want to reach me out after the presentation. And uh, at the moment, I'm working for uh, Northern.tech. And uh, the two very relevant for the stock uh, products we are developing are uh, Mender, which is uh, over the air updater for uh, embedded Linux devices. It's integrated with Yocto. I don't know how many of you have heard about Yocto before. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's fully integrated with Yocto, it's written in Go. And uh, we are having both at this conference, and uh, later today we will have a both as well. So if you are interested, then uh, feel free to join. And uh, the other product we are developing is uh, CF Engine. Someone heard about CF Engine before? Okay, a couple of people. So uh, this is uh, written in C. It's uh, actually right now it's like 20th anniversary of the product. Uh, so it's there for a long time. Uh, and uh, I've been involved in developing both, so I feel I have quite a nice experience with uh, developing both Go and uh, C code. So a little bit on Go timelines. So it's a fairly new programming language. It was conceived in 2007 at Google uh, and was announced in uh, November 2009. And uh, Go is, uh, it's been started by writing a language specification. Uh, so it was possible to start some independent work on writing front-end for GCC by Ian Taylor in uh, 2008. And uh, then the first official release was in uh, 2012. And uh, Go guys are trying to keep like half a year release schedule. So uh, five years later, we have Go 1.9 release August this year. And... Uh, some of you might ask, uh, why do we need yet another programming language? We have plenty already. So uh, Go was created by Google 
to meet the needs of Google developers, basically. And it's supported by Google all the time. And uh, I really do think that all the programming languages uh, reflect somehow the philosophy of the cre creators. So Go was born to fix, somehow improve the issue of the system suffering from an explosion of complexity at Google. So simplicity, together with efficient compilation, efficient execution, and easiness of programming uh, were three main uh, principles for uh, creating Go. Now uh, let's move on to why we've selected Go for uh, developing our new product. So uh, when we started discussing uh, and the decision-making process, we somehow divided uh, the requirements into two groups. Uh, and uh, in the first one, we've placed all the things which are somehow facing the end users. And the second one was more uh, internal points. So uh, I would like to expand a little bit on both. So uh, at the point when uh, we started developing our new product, uh, we knew that uh, our application will be running on embedded <coughs> devices and that we want to provide easy integration with Yocto. So in the first group, we've put uh, size requirements on the device, so the smaller, the better. Then uh, we knew the Yocto thing, and uh, we knew that it will run on embedded devices, so possibility of cross-compiling for a different architectures was a must. And uh, then in the other group, we put more internal things, so uh, competences in the company, Obviously, the more people know the technology, the better. Then uh, we've been discussing possibility of sharing and reusing the existing code base we've been having. And uh, then development speed. So uh, I'm just wondering how many of you have faced pressure to add new features fast? <laughs> <laughs> to like ship the code quickly. It's great if you always have time to do the simple, nice code. But uh, it's not always the case. So uh, very often you need to neglect simplicity. You need to do some kind of like workarounds and stuff. So uh, Go is really productive language. And uh, th this was a big point for us. And then uh, we knew that our device will be so-called uh, IoT device. So some kind of network uh, connectivity will be needed. So uh, we've been looking for access to like network libraries like HTTP, then SSL, JSON. And uh, then we've been also discussing some kind of like uh, things that will make the programming easier uh, and less error prone, like uh, automatic memory management, for example, or security enablers, thing like uh, buffer overflow protection and uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, based on our findings, we've created a comparison of a couple of languages, and uh, C, C plus plus, and Go were three to somehow go to the final round. And uh, you can see here how those compare to each other and how they fulfilled our requirements. And uh, this is the state as when we discussed all the things. So uh, right now, a couple of things changed, like uh, competences in the company. So more people know Go right now. And then uh, uh, when we started with Go, we needed extra layer in Yocto, but right now, uh, yeah, there is this small asterisk. Uh, as from Yocto Pyro release, uh, Go is fully integrated with Yocto, so you don't need any extra layers for uh, developing Go code. And uh, then we did some uh, more tests using Yocto, so been, we've been checking like uh, image size, then uh, image size with network stack, because we knew that uh, we'll need some kind of network connectivity. And then we've been also uh, discussing how we are delivering the end artifact to devices. So uh, Yocto is, can be actually statically compiled to the single binary, so we don't need any virtual machines and any extra dependencies running on your device to, to use the, the Go code you've been developing. And uh, after heated discussions, we finally decided that uh, we'll go with Go. So uh, 
the main reasons were that uh, Go is having extremely rich standard library, so uh, a lot of features there, and it allows uh, fast development of applications. Then it turned out that uh, learning curve from C to Golang is not uh, very steep. And in fact, from C, Go is inheriting a lot of things like uh, expression syntax, control flow statements, uh, data structures, pointers, uh, passing by value, uh, call by value, parameter parsing. Uh, so uh, a lot of things. And uh, also, if you know Python, uh, like string handling is kind of like Python-ish. Uh, and uh, Go is also compiled language. So uh, Go is having optimized compiler and runs natively on uh, embedded devices. Can be statically linked. Uh, I'll expand on this uh, a little bit later. And uh, then there is really nice uh, coverage for uh, cross compilation. And uh, we've been also doing some tests with the uh, size of uh, Go application. And uh, we've been trying to compare it with uh, static C binaries. So uh, as you will see, there are not uh, such a big differences. And uh, we've been also, fairly important thing for us was that uh, we could develop both backend and the client in the same language. So we've been discussing all the possibilities of like uh, sharing the code, uh, sharing developers. Uh, and uh, I'll expand a little bit on uh, both size and performance of uh, Go application. So uh, the first example uh, here is the smallest uh, Go application you can write. It's uh, Hello World, and uh, it's using built-in print line function. And uh, after stripping uh, debugging symbols, it's uh, 600 kilobytes, a little bit more. So this is basically what the Go runtime overhead is. But uh, if you are trying to write like True Hello World application, what you will do is uh, you'll include a font package. So then the binary is much bigger. But uh, font package is having a lot of dependencies. So like 10 ish packages are included when uh, you're compiling the code with uh, font package included. And uh, uh, to compare with C, if you are building a dynamically linked library, then it's uh, really tiny, like 8 kilobytes. But uh, obviously, it has a lot of dependencies. And uh, if you do the same uh, static, abstract from the fact if it's a good idea or not, uh, then it's, uh, it's bigger. So after stripping debugging symbols, it's uh, 800 kilobytes. So even bigger than, uh, than Go binary. And uh, then a, a little bit on uh, Go speed. So uh, initially, the title of this slide was uh, performance. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the speed in general. So uh, if you're interested in uh, performance, then uh, maybe you're familiar with this uh, computer language benchmarks game. So uh, you can uh, follow the link and uh, see the detailed benchmarks of uh, various programming languages. Uh, so you can see how Go compares to other languages, uh, how it's doing with uh, executing various uh, algorithms. But uh, in general, Go is fully garbage collected, so this slows down the thing, things. Uh, and uh, there are ways to switch the garbage collection off, but uh, I'm not experimenting with this stuff, and uh, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. Uh, then uh, you cannot really say where the variable will be allocated. So uh, we've seen. Uh, you can decide that you want to allocate the variables on the stack or on the heap. With Go, compiler is trying to make some educated decision where the variable should be. You can see where the variable will be allocated if you pass uh, correct uh, build flags, but uh, you cannot force compiler to use the like stack only, for example. But uh, on the pros, Go is providing really extremely fast compilation. So uh, our source code, for example, is uh, 15,000 lines of code. It's the client only. And the comp compilation takes like 1.4 seconds. And uh, if you're doing some kind of like concurrent programming, then uh, Go is really well designed for, uh, for doing this. It's very easy and it's very performable. And then... Uh, the thing we've been discussing already, like the speed of developer. So uh, 
I really do think that Go is a productive language and you can develop your applications fast. So uh, turning your attention on uh, Go itself, we'll talk about a couple of things why I like Go. So uh, among the others, the standard library. So Go is, uh, the standard library is having like more than 100 packages. And just uh, naming the few, like runtime, you can uh, like uh, set some runtime uh, things like uh, garbage collection, you can switch it off, uh, you can select how many threads uh, you want to, OS threads you want to use. Then flag for uh, using, uh, for building uh, command line interfaces for par parsing command line arguments, net for any network communication. Then uh, various uh, data types with an encoding package, uh, really rich crypto package, so a lot of things you can do there. Then uh, unsafe and syscall at the end, very useful if you are doing any kind of like embedded-ish development. Then uh, Go comes with a lot of built-in tools, like uh, FAMT for uh, formatting the code. So Go forces you to use some and only one correct coding standard. Uh, then uh, there is test package with test coverage, some profiling tool, GoDoc uh, for creating uh, documentation from inline code comments, so it's kind of similar like Doxygen, then uh, go vet for doing static code analysis, race detector, and really many more. There's a there's lot of tools coming with Go uh, by default. And then a little bit on uh, compilation itself. So there are two Go compilers you can use. The original one is called GC, and it's written and maintained by, by Google. It's part of, uh, of default Go installation, but there is also GCC Go, which is front-end for uh, GCC. And uh, this one works fairly nice, but is lagging a little bit behind uh, GC. So right now GCC 7 supports Go 1.8.1, but I think GCC 8 will support Go 1.10, so it's not uh, very far behind GC. And uh, as I mentioned already, compilation is extremely fast, and this was one of the principles of uh, creating Go. Then uh, you can create single binary file, uh, no extra dependencies, no virtual machines, but uh, we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later as well. And uh, you can still use make files if you want, so uh, the link shows an example of our make file we are using. And uh, cross-compilation, so uh, a lot of platforms support it. So uh, to cross-compile the Go application, you need to like set two flags, Go S, which is uh, operating system, and Go Arc. And then just type Go Build, and uh, it will cross-compile binary for a given OS and a given uh, uh, architecture. So uh, quite a wide selection of both OSs and uh, and platforms support it. Then uh, a little bit on uh, debugging. So you can still use GDB if you want, but uh, there are some coordinator cases where GDB don't work extremely nice with uh, Go, particularly heavy concurrent applications. Uh, GDB is having some issues uh, when uh, trying to debug those, but there is dedicated Go compiler called Delve. Uh, very similar to GDB, almost the same user interface. Then uh, testing. It's extremely easy to add unit tests and benchmarks to Go code. So testing is built in the language, and all you need is to create a file with a test suffix, and then uh, add a test prefix to your function, uh, import testing package, and then the only thing you need to do is run go test and uh, all your tests will be automatically picked up from your source and uh, executed. So uh, right now I'll go very quickly through some code samples. So uh, you can find it in uh, many places, but uh, just to give you some overview how go syntax looks like. So uh, 
Here we can see how to declare variables, and the variables are pretty much the same as in, in C, the basic ones. So what's different is uh, at the end uh, you have this f colon equals one, so this is like shortened uh, syntax for uh, declaring variables, and then you can do like tuple assignments, so uh, multiple variables having multiple values, functions. Uh, I guess what I want to emphasize here is that you can have multiple return values, which is very useful. So you can return the value and error, for example. Uh, yeah, we are using this uh, this a lot. Uh, then, Go is not object-oriented language, or at least this is something that Google guys are claiming, but uh, there are some object-oriented uh, principles in the language. So uh, you can create a struct, and then you can create a method on the struct. So uh, the func s square area, so square is a receiver, so it's kind of like uh, this pointer in C++. So uh, you can call this function on the square object. And uh, interfaces uh, are also some kind of like uh, object-oriented uh, principle. So uh, those are not defined explicitly, like in Java, for example, like this object implements this interface. Uh, so in Go, uh, uh, if the type uh, has given function, it satisfies the interface implicitly. And then you can have like, uh, if you see the main snippet, you can call the function on behalf of the interface. So you don't necessarily know in the runtime what kind of object, what kind of type this is, but as long as it uh, implements the print function, then it satisfies the print interface and you can use it dynamically. And then uh, a little bit on uh, concurrency. So Go is having two built-in mechanisms, goroutines and channels. So goroutines are kind of like lightweight threads, but uh, the initial size is only two kilobytes and uh, Go is having its own internal scheduler. So uh, the Go routines are multiplexed like M to N to OS threads. And then there are channels. So those are like pipes for uh, exchanging messages between uh, various Go routines. And you can have blocked and uh, uh, non blocking uh, channels, buffered, unbuffered. Very useful way of uh, exchanging uh, messages, and uh, those are used a lot for uh, synchronizing the threads, uh, the Go routines as well. And it's very easy to create a Go routine. The only thing you need to do is to add the Go in front of the function. And uh, when you do this, the function is executed concurrently. And the channel is also very easy to create its make, chan, and the type of the channel, and then uh, there are two operators to write to the channel. It's this like R to the channel and then to read from the channel. Uh, so uh, you can also use uh, your C code with Go. So uh, there are some bindings for uh, C applications. So the only thing you need to do is import C and then Go is creating this virtual C package uh, so when you are using any package in Go, uh, the syntax is like package name dot and the method or the like type from the package. So it's the same with C. So uh, if you're using a C package, then uh, you're like calling C dot something to, to use some C function. And uh, uh, quite important note here is that uh, Go is garbage collected, but C is not. So if you're using any C variables in a Go code, which are uh, allocated on the heap inside C code, you need to explicitly free those uh, variables inside Go. Uh, and then you can also use C++ inside uh, Go code. I haven't been using this myself, but uh, there is this simplified wrapper and interface generator. So this was created to uh, kind of binds uh, C and C++ with uh, languages like Python, for example, interpreted languages. Uh, so there is also 
Go module to C++, so we can use C++ inside Go code. And then uh, I said that uh, Go is uh, compiled to the single binary, uh, but uh, you can also uh, use the shared libraries. So it's working on x86 architecture only uh, at the moment, uh, but uh, you can both create like uh, Go shared library that will be used inside C code, and you can create like Go shared library that you can use inside other Go applications. So uh, very useful when, for example, you want to replace only a part of your C application. So you can easily create shared Go library and then you can use this library, include this library and link against your uh, C application. Uh, and uh, a little bit uh, on embedded Go. So I, as I said before, uh, you cannot really force Go to like use stack only, or you cannot say where the variable will be allocated, but uh, you can see uh, if you provide this uh, minus GC flags minus M uh, arguments where the variable will be allocated. So uh, Go is uh, based on the size of the object and uh, Go is doing something called uh, escape analysis to see, uh, it tries to avoid dangling pointers. So you can have a local variable inside a function but you can return this variable. So in C you'll have a dangling pointer with Go, Go is trying to be smart enough to allocate this variable on the heap. And then inside other functions, you can still reference that variable. And then unsafe code. So uh, if you want to write something directly to memory in C, you can, whether you like this syntax or not, you can use it. But uh, in Go, uh, it's also possible to manipulate hardware directly, but it's intentionally hard. So uh, here is the sample of uh, manipulating GPIO of Raspberry Pi and it's memory mapped uh, GPIO. So uh, as you can see you can uh, like syscall map and then uh, uh, map the file and then uh, you're using a lot of like unsafe pointer things to uh, to address memory directly. So uh, it's there, it's possible it's also not pretty, but uh, but you can use it. And uh, I would like to talk a bit about our experience with Go so far. So uh, there is a lot of uh, like uh, positive things about Go we like, but uh, there are also like things I personally think uh, could be done better. So. Uh, when you are using third party libraries, there is no standardized tool for uh, for this. So uh, there is plenty of uh, third party tools for vendoring uh, external dependencies. A little bit messy, could be improved, but uh, I think Go guys are working on this actively to create some built-in tools for, uh, uh, for fixing this issue. Then uh, there is quite a lot external libraries out there, but uh, there is a lot of really bad ones. So you need to be very careful what kind of libraries you're using. And uh, then when we started with Go and the Octo, we've been having some issue with uh, like uh, building uh, Yocto images uh, because uh, Yocto was not supporting Go uh, natively, so we had to use some uh, third-party layers to, to build Go code. We've been fixing those layers a lot uh, because not everything was working out of the box uh, for us. And uh, then before Go 1.5, uh, there's been also like issue with bootstrapping the Go code. So it wasn't like uh, extremely walk in the park to, to build the Go binary, but right now, Go layer is integrated with Yocto, so all the issues we've been facing at the very beginning two years ago are gone right now. And uh, I've been also mentioning about like extremely nice compiling and uh, cross compiling. So this is gone when you're using C Go. So when you have some C bindings inside your Go code, then it's not 
as easy as uh, as when uh, building go only applications so when you have c bindings then you need to provide uh, all like c infrastructure cross compiler and stuff for uh, for building uh, c part of go application but uh, at the same time there is a lot of things uh, that we like in go so uh, it was very easy to do the transition uh, from C and Python. So uh, it like, literally took a couple of days to be fairly productive with Go. And then we are using uh, Go tools and uh, standard library a lot, and those are really nice tools. So uh, we are not, in fact, using a lot of external tools for uh, doing the stuff we need. And uh, we've been also discussing at the beginning, uh, before we started uh, developing our product in Go, that we'll be able to exchange some kind of tasks between backend team and the client team. This uh, hasn't happened a lot, but uh, we have some shared uh, libraries we are using, or shared code bases. And uh, we've been able to use a lot of infrastructure so for example ci looks more or less the same for the backend and for the client with some you know like small differences and uh, i really do think that go is very productive language so if you need to develop your application fast and uh, if you need to include some kind of network communication then it's it's very productive and uh, this is kind of like mixed feeling, the last point, so a lot of people disagree with this and a lot of people don't like this, but uh, I really think that forced coding standard is a really nice idea because uh, like, no matter what kind of code you are looking at, it's always the same, it looks the same. So, uh, and also you don't have to spend like uh, hours before you start developing, should we use this coding standard or something else, it's there, it's only one, way of developing applications in Go, and it's forced. So it's very easy to read the code. And uh, right now, we have still like uh, 10 minutes, so I'll try to show you a demo of uh, embedded Go application. So uh, yeah, I'm having here a beagle bone with, uh, uh, probably it's hard to see uh, at the back, but uh, I'm having DHT11, like temperature and uh, humidity sensor. And then I'm having infrared distance sensor here and a small buzzer as well. It was disconnected from the power, but maybe I'll connect it now. And uh, I'm running here a like uh, application that uh, exports all the readings through web interface. Uh, so uh, we can see how this works. We can uh, take a look at the code. So th this is how I'm compiling my application. So if you are familiar with Yocto, it's fairly standard. We don't need any extra Go layers right now, any extra commands. It's like bit bake and uh, I'm building an image for uh, my application. It's taking a while, so uh, maybe while it's building, I will show you a little bit of source code. So uh, this is a main.go file, so it's like first file that it's uh, compiled or uh, inside this file, uh, go is looking for the main function, so this is where everything starts. So uh, yeah, here uh, yeah, I'm initializing some uh, in-memory store for uh, like storing a couple of last readings. And then we are creating a uh, channel for uh, 
reading data from uh, humidity and temperature sensor and then this uh, you can see go here so this is uh, coroutine so uh, functions run concurrently and uh, this function is waiting blocked waiting for the data from uh, this uh, uh, DHT11 sensor and then stores the data inside the memory and then this go read DHT function defined later uh, is actually calling read the humitemp so This uh, HIO model is uh, the one created with CGO, so I'm having a couple of C and H files. And uh, here, the HT Go, so I'm importing C. And uh, for reading the data from the uh, DHT11 sensor, I'm simply calling this C function, and then I'm uh, converting the return uh, uh, values to go once and uh, I'm returning this from the function. So uh, quite easy to do this stuff. Uh, and uh, where's my mouse? Here you can see also uh, how easy it is to start uh, a web server. So the start server you are creating a handlers. So uh, what kind of functions will be executed when uh, different regex will be matched? And then the only thing you need to do is listen and serve and uh, provide the port on which you are listening. So uh, my application is uh, is built. So uh, now I can update my device to like start this application. So to do this, to do this, I will use Mender. So I can see I have a couple of devices here, so I'm uh, accepting my device. And uh, once it will be authorized, I'll be able to create a update for this device. So this is my BeagleBone, and it's running release two at the moment. And uh, first I need to upload artifact, so it will be This one. Okay, then devices again. And I want to create a deployment for this device. Okay, now deployment is pending, so device will uh, first uh, try to connect with the server and uh, figure out that, okay, there is a uh, deployment for this device. And right now it's downloading the image. So it's probably should take like less than a second. Uh, I'm on a local network. I could do SSH as well to copy the binary, but uh, uh, in this particular case, the device is here. So I can do like even SD image DD and then uh, copy to the SD card. But uh, Usually in our CI, for example, the devices are out there somewhere. So uh, this is the way we are updating the devices to test the applications and uh, our application as well. Uh, so uh, the whole image is uh, is pretty big. Uh, probably that's why it's taking some time to, to download it. Uh, but uh, once device will be once it will download the image, it will reboot the device because it's uh, like uh, uh, copied to inactive partition. The device is having two partitions, active and inactive, and then uh, this is for uh, doing some kind of like failover if something goes uh, bad.
Okay, let's hope it will finish in a reasonable time. Okay, you can see this uh, sound, so device is, uh, is running with the new image. Maybe we'll disconnect this for a second. So device is rebooting right now, and uh, once device is rebooted, we'll see that uh, the new, applications is, uh, new application is installed on device, and uh, I will show you what this application is doing. So let's give it like a couple of more seconds. Okay, success. So device is updated. And uh, right now I can... Okay, so uh, right now we can see the la latest uh, reading from the DHT11 sensor. So the temperature here is like 22.8 uh, Celsius degree, sounds about right. And the humidity is uh, 59%. We can also see like uh, history. So this is some graphs, how temperature and the humidity was changing over time. We can do the data export, for example, and this is to show how easy it is. This was like literally three lines to convert the binary data to JSON and uh, export it. So those are the last 10 readings of uh, temperature. Uh, so JSON data, you can use it in uh, like whatever you want. And then uh, I have uh, infrared distance sensor. So uh, hopefully if uh, something will be in range of the sensors, a sensor you'll see the red circle. And if it's out of range, then uh, you'll see the, the green one. So let's try. OK. It's kind of working. So I'm using WebSocket here. So when I, I'm close to the sensor, then you can see Okay, it's there, and it's out of range. So this is basically it. So uh, any questions, comments? Yeah. So the question was if the history is kept on device. Yes, it's. Uh, uh, like uh, right now, I'm having probably like. 8 gigs SD memory card, so quite a lot of readings. Uh, but uh, I've implemented like in-memory cyclic buffer for uh, storing 10 last measurements, but you can use some kind of like database for uh, storing the data, so it's like actually your implementation. Uh, so the question was uh, about uh, crypto library in Go, if it's implemented by Go developers or if they're using some uh, third party things. So uh, I, I think it's a mix. So some of the things are uh, like Go natively implemented, but there are some like bindings to, to other things. Uh, so, question about licensing of Go code. Uh, it's some kind of like open source license, but I'm not sure about uh, the others. I think it's GPL3, well, okay, so but I, I might be wrong. So, typically there are problems with static libraries in GPL, that's what I was, what I was worried about. How do you get around the issue of uh, static libraries with GPL? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, uh, we have a, a colleague of mine uh, is uh, like more into the license and uh, he's uh, dealing with this all licensing stuff. So I'm sure it's sorted out somehow. But uh, yeah, so it's BSD license. Yeah. So none of the libraries have got GPL. Yeah. Uh, 
so the question was that my demo is based on channels and uh, if it's easy to use the channels to communicate with external applications. So uh, uh, not channels in particular, but you can use any kind of like inter-process communication. So you can use socket or you can use pipe thing, but uh, channels are uh, natively used by uh, Go applications for uh, communicating between different Go routines. So you cannot use the channels to communicate with other applications. Uh, so the question was, uh, I mentioned initially that we've been having some issues with integrating our code with Yocto. Uh, and uh, what's my impression with the latest uh, Yocto releases? So uh, it's working extremely smoothly. We don't have any issues with uh, like latest Go releases and uh, like compiling Go code. Yeah, so uh, the question was if, if it covers all the dependencies we are having in our application, yes. So uh, we we are using, like besides of our extra layers uh, for configuring the device, uh, we don't need any extra layers for compiling both Go and the C bindings we are using inside Go code. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much and good luck with Go.